is to learn about the battles that surrounded the biblical text, mainly between the three religions, Jews, Jew, uh, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And finally, we're going to address the shift from traditional to, to a traditional type of learning to biblical criticism, again, involving the biblical text. So far, what have we done? So in the previous session, we mainly devoted our attention to the first two Bs. Uh, we started in the introduction talking about the different text witnesses, the different physical copies of the Bible that survived, starting from the priestly blessing and so on. We spoke about some textual versions of the Bible. So far, we mainly discussed the Masoretic text and the Septuagint. Uh, that was sections two and three. And then in the previous session, after discussing the type of differences between the Masoretic text and the Septuagint, we started approaching the second B of the course, the battles part. Uh, in the previous session, we mainly devoted our attention to Jewish Christian debates. We learned that Christians on the one hand were trying to revise or correct the Septuagint in long, so that would follow or be closer to the Masoretic text. That's on the one hand, but at the same time, in cases where it involved theological significance, Christians started accusing Jews of having forged their Bibles, of having removed certain uh, verses or certain allusions to Christianities from their text. We brought uh, one famous example, the verse in Isaiah about the Betula, that according to, in the Masoretic text, it states Alma, but Christians argued that the original reading was Betula and Jews have forged that text. And there were a few other verses of that type. Today, we'll talk about the third uh, party here, about Islam. And our main interest will be uh, to discuss how did Muslims treat the biblical text. However, since we're less familiar with the story of Islam and with the Quran, so what I decided we will do is start with a brief survey and only then proceed uh, and discuss what did Muslims think about the biblical text, about the uh, Masoretic text or about the biblical text in general. So the outline of today's class, again, the main theme today is the Muslim-Jewish battle over the biblical text. We're mainly going to talk about the Islamic perspective and not address the way that Jews responded. That will wait for next week. So what are we doing today? The first thing outlined for today's class, the first thing we're going to do is provide a very, very brief survey of the history of Islam. A very brief survey, just so we know uh, what time are we, what period are we talking about? and some essential facts that are going to be useful as we discuss this uh, theme. The second issue we're going to talk about is the Quran. We're going to provide, aim to provide a brief, short description of the Quran. Third theme, we're going to talk about something about the relationship between Muslims and Jews in early Islam. And finally, that will be our main goal, talk about the Islamic approach to the Hebrew Bible, or uh, or specifically the idea of tahrif, the concept of tahrif. Sometimes people refer to it as tabdil. So uh, this is going to be the last thing we're going to talk about. So I hope we're ready. We're starting with the first item. The first item, brief history of Islam. I didn't want to bring uh, on the screen share too many words, so I decided we'll do it mainly through uh, illustrations. So let's follow some of these ancient, these are not modern stuff, ancient illustrations that tell the story of Islam. So the story of Islam starts more or less, this is a issue that is debated among scholars, but more or less in the year 570. That's the year when Muhammad was born. Muhammad was born probably in the city of Mecca and his birth is not described in uh, ancient Islamic sources in a miraculous manner, the way that Jesus' birth is described in Christianity. It's a fairly simple description, although in later traditions, people will come up with more elaborated ideas and more, uh, they'll add in more uh, elements to the story that will make it a little bit more special and more, uh, again, uh, involving some miracles, as you see in the illustration here. So Muhammad is born in the city of Mecca in the year 570. And the, in the first 40 years of his life, nothing special really happens. He's just, uh, 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 living his ordinary life as a merchant in the area in the Saudi, in the, the area of what is called the uh, Arab Saudi Arabia, 
of today. So this is his first 40 years. Only when he reaches the age 40, when he's a little bit more mature, uh, something special happens. He moves, he's wandering in, the, in his uh, area near his hometown, and he's trying to travel to some to the desert. He's going to the desert, and he's uh, sitting in a cave, and suddenly he hears a voice speaking to him. The voice that was speaking to him, according to Islamic tradition, is the voice of Gabriel, the angel. And Gabriel, the angel, is the person who will, is the entity who will communicate with Muhammad throughout his life. Muhammad is not communicating with God himself, but rather uh, through the assistance of Gabriel, the angel. Gabriel is actually the only angel that also appears in the Hebrew Bible by name in the book of Daniel. And he's the angel that also communicates with uh, Muhammad. Uh, I, I should point out, all the information I'm giving you now is not recorded in the Quran itself. It's only recorded in some oral traditions in the, in the Hadith, in Islamic tradition, and also is based on the, on the Prophet's autobiography by Ibn Isakhak that was only written about a uh, hundred years afterwards. So this is, this is not information that is found in the Quran, but rather in Islamic traditions. So again, the he was born 570. In the year 610, he's receiving his first prophecy. Uh, here you have an illustration of his first revelation. After his first revelation, he starts preaching to people in his nearby area. And more and more people are starting to be impressed with his uh, visions or with his uh, preaching and starting to join him. Nevertheless, Muhammad is not as successful as he wishes. And people in his hometown in Mecca are starting to become a little bit uncomfortable with this new prophet that is uh, coming up with all these revolutionary ideas. And after he feels he's being threatened, or according to some Islamic tradition, the angel warns him that he's under uh, in a big danger. And he decides he has to move away from the city of Mecca to another city in Saudi Arabia, to the city of Medina. So here you see the journey of the of Muhammad, which is called in Arabic the Hijra. Hijra is like the word in Hebrew Hagira, or immigration, and that takes place in the year 622. So about 12 years after he starts preaching in Mecca, he needs to escape from his hometown from Mecca and travel to Medina. In Islamic uh, in his Islamic tradition, the years are counting from the Hijra. So from uh, Islamic perspective, today is uh, the year that we're holding now is about uh, 1400 or so, because you have to deduct from 2022, uh, all the years only starts from the year 622. So this is the year of the Hijra, a very important step in the history of Islam. Muhammad settles in the city of Medina, and from then on, he's starting to preach again for the people in Medina, and here he's a lot more successful. He's fighting some battles in Medina and trying, he's earning more and more support, support. And eventually after he's strong enough, he will return back to the city of Mecca. But this time he's the one who sets the rules and the people of Mecca are supposed to listen and follow what he's saying. The, uh, if I'm saying uh, to, to listen or to submit, the word Islam means, to, uh, the idea of the word Islam is in Hebrew, you say masel, to submit yourself to something. So people in Mecca now are forced to accept his new, uh, his new uh, ideas, the new ideas of Islam. Sometime in the course of his lifetime, according to one tradition, Islamic tradition, Muhammad travels on a special horse, uh, what is called the night journey, and he's going to the extreme mosque, Al-Aqsa. Which mosque did he go to? So this was a matter of discussion in earlier years of Islam. People and most Muslims today believe that Muhammad travels from the city of Mecca to Jerusalem. And then from Jerusalem, he ascends to heaven and then he goes back. So that's why we have three holy cities in Islam. We have the city of Mecca, we have the city of Medina, two important cities in Islam that are specified more in his uh, writing. And also the city of Jerusalem, which is only hinted or alluded to according to some Islamic traditions. Uh, here you see, this is the map. So you see the places that we mentioned before. So the main cities are Mecca and Medina. They're about 150 kilometers apart. 
And this is Yerushalayim. So you see that according to some traditions, he has, he's traveling with his buka uh, from Mecca all the way to Jerusalem and back. And that's why these become the most important cities of uh, Yerushalayim. El-Aqsa is the mosque that was named after the tradition that appears in, the, in Islam about this extreme mosque. What else can we say about Muhammad? So we spoke about his return to Mecca. And soon afterwards, uh, Muhammad dies. He didn't live for too many years to enjoy this success because in the year 632, Muhammad dies in Mecca. At, before he dies, uh, he also makes very clear that the center of worship will be in the place of the Kaaba. The Kaaba probably uh, should be translated to the word cube. So that's a, a, a site of worship that was already uh, very central for many people before the time of Muhammad but he sanctifies this place and makes it into a holy site uh, for all Muslims. And that's why the Kaaba at Mecca is considered the holiest place that each Muslim is supposed to pay a visit at least once in his lifetime. And then he becomes a Hajj. So this is a very, very brief description of the history of Islam during Muhammad's own lifetime. And a few more other words, that what happens afterwards, again, everything will become important later on. Uh, after Muhammad dies, there's a short period in Islam that is called the period of the Rashidun. The word Rashidun translates the perfect or rightly guided leaders or caliphs, successors. And this is a period that stretches over about 30 years from years from the year 632 to the year 661. And four caliphs, four successors take over uh, after Muhammad dies. This period is perceived as a very uh, special period or a successful period, the golden age of Islam before uh, big splits are gonna take place. Uh, and the four caliphs are Abu Bakr, Umar ibn al-Hattab, Uthman ibn Affan, and Ali ibn Abi Talib. So those are the four caliphs, the four successors after Muhammad uh, dies. In the life, of Ali at the end, uh, that, that's, or after, I'm sorry, after the death of Ali, there's a big split that emerges between the Sunnis and the Shiites because the Sunni, the Shiites expected, they believed that Muhammad really wanted Ali to be his real uh, follower, the one who would replace him. And this and other reasons connected to a big war for the battle of Karbala will lead to the biggest split of Islam between the Sunnis and the Shiites. And this is really beyond our uh, the theme of discourse. So I think in terms of this survey, this basic survey of Islam, that would probably uh, be sufficient. Now we'll say a few words about the second, next theme that is important for us, and that is uh, the Quran. Oh, here I just wanted to add one more thing. Here you see a map. The red part in the map is the part of, uh, is the region in which Islam uh, spreads already during the, the time of Muhammad himself. The orange is only in the later period, during the period of the Rashidun, and the yellow part is even later on during the, uh, the uh, Abbasid uh, Empire, which will only follow later on. And again, this is beyond the time frame that we're gonna be discussing today. So the red part is Muhammad's lifetime, and the orange part is during the four caliphs. So you see Islam spreads very fast in a fairly short time. And this leads us to the next thing, which is the Quran. So let's say a few words about the Quran. I don't know if you got to read the book, if you ever uh, explored this text, but we'll just say a few words about this text and uh, then we can proceed. So what is the word Quran? What is the meaning of the word Quran? Anybody knows what's the meaning of the word? What's the root? Yeah. Hey, like to read, I would assume. Right, it's the same root as, just like in Hebrew people say, not just Tanakh, they say Mikra, a text that you read. So the Quran is essentially the same thing. It's a text that is being read. In contrast to the Mishnah that we recite orally, the Mikra is a text that we read from a book, and so is the Quran. So the Quran is just the Mikra of the Muslim world. The Mikra is very, the Quran is very different both from the Old Testament Hebrew Bible and from the New Testament. Whereas the Hebrew Bible, New Testament, is a collection of many, many compositions that were composed over a long period of time, fairly long stretch of time, and by different people, and 
written in many, many different genres. The Quran is just one book, all based on Muhammad's revelations by, the, by Gabriel, the angel. So it's not a collection of many, many different people gathered in one book. It's all prophecies of Muhammad from beginning to end, the entire corpus. Some of the prophecies or some of these revelations are uh, formulated in different genres. So some of them tend to be more historical, some of them tend to be more poetic, but it's all revelations that were uh, uh, given to Muhammad. So in a, we're talking about something that happens in a fairly short period of time. The Muhammad was not written as a book in Muhammad's own lifetime. It was transmitted orally even after his life. And it's only the third caliph, here I'll show you his name again. It's only in the time of Uthman ibn Affan, about, you know, I would say almost 15 years or so after Muhammad dies, that the book was already put into writing, became uh, a written text. This gap of a bunch of these, this number of years leaves room for all sorts of speculation as to whether the Quran that we have nowadays is the original, the precise original formulation of the Quran as was revealed to Muhammad. And this is not something that, that scholars raise, uh, that only scholars in university raise, even Muslims themselves sometimes ask questions as regarding the original formulation of the Quran. What is the Quran? The Quran, as I said, is the revelations of Muhammad and it's divided into chapters. Each chapter of the Quran is called a surah. A surah is the chapter in the Quran. The Quran includes 114 surahs altogether. Uh, each surah is divided to verses. The verses are called, uh, in plural it says, it's called ayat. I think one is ayah, and in plural it's ayat. So we have ayah, verse, and then surah, which is the chapter itself. The sequence of the surahs is a big issue because the surahs are not sorted chronologically. The surahs don't start from the earliest time of Muhammad's uh, life in uh, Mecca and move on to Medina and then go back to Mecca. That's not the case, but rather they're sorted by size. The longer surahs appear in the beginning of the Quran and the, late, and the smaller ones uh, appear at the end. So it's just a matter of size. The number of verses in the surah determines the size of the, of the surah. And therefore we start from the biggest one and we move to the smallest one. That is with the exception of the first surah, the first chapter, the first revelation that is called Al-Fatiha, the opening, which is the same text that Muslims use for their prayers five times a day. But beyond, besides that, the surahs are sorted from the biggest to the smallest. One of the scholars that actually uh, spoke about this and discovered and uh, dealt with this was Abraham Geiger, the founder of the reform movement. And he's the, also the person who figured out that the Mishnah is also sorted by size, meaning the longer the Masechet is, the earlier it appears in each one of the Sdarim, of the six Sdarim. That's just a side point because Abraham Geiger in his earlier stage of his career was involved with Quran and Islam. So he also uh, came up to this conclusion that maybe the Mishnah is following also a, a, a criteria or the the way it's, it's sorted is by size and not by any anything that involves this, the theme of the text. So if the text is not sorted chronologically, but rather by size, Muslims are facing a very big problem. Why? Uh, when in many of the surahs, when the surahs are, uh, the text in the Quran that appears in the surah is not just something that tells Muslims about their theology, but it's also the source of Islamic law. However, in many, many places in the Quran, we find contradictions. Certain legal statements might contradict each other in the Quran. One of the most famous examples involves drinking wine. In one place, the Quran allows to drink wine. In another place, it might it seems like it's almost encouraging it. But in a third place, it says that drinking wine, drinking alcohol is forbidden. So how do Muslims decide what to follow? Muslims, uh, have a rule that is called nas or abrogation. The latest revelation is the one that determines the law, the halakha. So if you have to decide which revelation came first, which one came last, and the bottom line, the latest revelation is the one that we follow. How do we know which revelation is the later and which one is the earlier one? 
if the, the surahs are not sorted chronologically. If they were sorted chronologically, see, so would just follow the place where they appear in the book. But since the surahs do not appear chrono in a chronological order, so how do we know which surah to follow, which ruling should we follow? For this purpose, uh, Muslim have a tradition for each one of the surahs, when did it go down from heaven to Muhammad? It's called in Arabic, Isabab el nazul the timing in which the surah went down. So each uh, surah has its own tradition. When did Muhammad hear that uh, revelation? When was he exposed to that revelation? And following that, they can determine which, which surah came first and determine which is the bottom line. In the case of drinking wine, unfortunately or fortunately, whatever you want to think, uh, the ruling was that Muslims are forbidden from drinking wine. The latest revelation is the one that talks that uh, prohibits drinking alcohol. Uh, the first revelation in the, in the Quran, from a historical perspective, according to the Islamic tradition, is that I think it's the 93rd uh, surah, and that's the one that Muslims claim is a dis description or some form of record of the earliest revelation that Muhammad receives when he's in this uh, cave somewhere in the desert. So this is a little bit about the, the sequence or the order of the surahs in the Quran. The Quran is written in Arabic and Muslims had a, made a very big point not to translate the text into other languages for many, many years. One reason for that was because Muslims believe that the only way that, that the proof, what, the way that one can demonstrate or prove that the Quran comes from heaven is by its own linguistic qual qualities. Muslims will argue that a human being would not be able to compose such a text, such a beautiful text on, uh, without any divine assistance. However, this is only something that they will claim one can appreciate in its original language in Arabic. And that's why for many, many centuries, Muslims did not allow people or, and certainly did not encourage people to read the Quran in other languages. They also insisted not to print the Quran, that's a separate issue, but write it manually. But also they, they certainly preferred that people would only read the Quran in its original language. It does not mean that people didn't know what the Quran is saying in other cultures, Jews and Christians must have known, we know that they knew a lot about it, but it, it was probably not a very common text in other languages. Uh, by now, the Quran is already translated to many, many languages. It was translated to Hebrew somewhere probably in the 16th century, but we don't have a record of that translation as far as I remember. But in the 1850s, a Jew uh, that lived in Eastern Europe, I think his name is Reckendorf, so he translated the Quran into Arabic. And following that, we have a few more translations. Uh, Yosef Rivlin, the father of Ruby Rivlin, the Israeli president, he translated the Quran into Hebrew. And afterwards, a few years later, another guy whose name is Rubin, who just passed away recently. So there are numerous Hebrew translations of the Quran, but they all come from the 19th and 20th century. So this is a very, very, very basic description of the Quran. The Quran, one more thing is important to mention. Uh, as I said, it's not one type of genre. It has a lot of historical information. And if you read the Quran, you will see that many parts of the Quran resemble, overlap biblical stories. A lot of figures from the Hebrew Bible appear in the Quran. Ibrahim, Isaac, Yusuf, Musa, all these are people from the Hebrew Bible. Abraham, Isaac, Moses, Joseph, and many, many other figures. Stories that appear in the Bible also repeat themselves in the Quran. If you were to use a highlighter and highlight all the parts in the Quran, that overlap with stories in the Bible, a major section of the Quran will be probably highlighted. So the Quran really is, a, is a overlapping in many ways with the Hebrew Bible and with the New Testament. Jesus also appears in the Quran. His birth, the story of the birth of Jesus appears in the Quran and other stories appear in the Quran as well. Even post-biblical parts, texts, post-biblical in terms of Hebrew Bible, but also later to the New Testament appear and are even quoted in the Quran. There are Mishnayot, texts from the Mishnah that are almost uh, quoted, I would say it in a literal sense, in the Quran. And certainly uh, there's a very strong influence of Jewish law on the Quran. 
Uh, I'll give you one example. The halacha we know in Mishnah and Brachot, how one knows when the day is starting because you distinguish between two uh, similar colors. If you can tell the difference between tcheret elavan or tcheret lekarti, between white and blue or white and green, that same halacha also appears in the Quran. Or uh, there's a Mishnah from Tractate Sanhedrin that is also quoted in the Quran. There are also verses that are quoted in the Quran uh, in a literal sense, not just that you see the, if you're, a similar tradition appears in the Quran, but almost, almost direct uh, quotations from the Book of Psalms, for example, and other things uh, as well. The Book of Psalms, I think, is called Zabu in the, in, in the Quran. So this was a very, very brief description of what is the Quran. Now we're moving to the third brief uh, part of the introduction. Then we can finally approach our main interest, which is how did Muslims treat the biblical story? So what was the type, what type of relationship uh, took place or went between Jew Muslims and Jews? It seems that Muhammad had very great expectations that Jews will follow him, will follow his preaching and will join his new, uh, his new religion. Some people might argue that he even shaped or uh, uh, decided to, to, uh, to build his religion in a way that will resemble certain ideas in Judaism, but also the very notion, the way he understood God as something more abstract. He felt this is something that would probably attract more Jews to his new religion. Also from a legal perspective, many laws in Islam resemble stories, uh, resemble laws that we find in, in Judaism. But Jewish people, as you all know, are not so easy to convince. They're pretty stubborn. And not too many people, not too many Jews joined Muhammad. When he's in Medina, he's reading, running a few battles against some Jewish tribes. Uh, there's even a tradition about a very massive uh, massacre that Muhammad is doing with one of the Jewish tribes. This is what you can see here in the illustration. And from then on, it's clear that Muhammad is distinguishing himself from Judaism. So in some way, you can see great influence of Judaism on Islam. Uh, the idea, certain ideas from Judaism are also uh, adopted by Islam. There's a name that people use for this, Israeliyat. But at the same time, there's also some attempt to distinguish between these two religions. And both of these ideas are very, very uh, visible when you look at the Islamic tradition. After the death of Muhammad, the Jews receive also a special status. They're called the people of the book. So on the one hand, they're, com they're certainly a competition, to Islam, but they have an elevator status compared to uh, pagans in the, in the Middle East. So this is a very, very brief description of Islam, of the Quran, and something about Jews and Muslims in the earlier stages of Islam. And now we're reaching uh, our main theme, and that is, what did Muslims think about the Hebrew Bible, or about the text of the Hebrew Bible? The Islamic approach to the Hebrew uh, Bible or a concept that is called the Tachrif, or in the, people sometimes refer to it as the as the Tabdil. Two similar words that use are used for the same basic idea. So we will what we will do now is address a few elements, or a few uh, yeah a few elements that involve uh, this idea of Tachrif. We will start by uh, one second. Okay, we'll start by defining the idea of tachrif. What is the definition of this concept? We'll talk a little bit about the motivation. Why did Muslims want to come up with this idea of the tachrif? We'll talk about the basis, the ground that uh, Muslims provided in order to support their argument, this idea of tachrif. We'll explain who was the target of this, uh, of this uh, concept, the inspiration, where did it get, from, where, who inspired Muslims to follow this idea. And finally, we'll also talk about a few examples. All of this will become clear in a second. So we'll just go one by one and I think things will become uh, very clear. So what is the definition of the tachrif or of the tabdil? Answer, tachrif or tabdil is the Islamic accusation that Jews have forged their Bible. Tachrif means forgery. So Muslims argue, Muslims claim, that Jews have forged their Bible. Uh, this accusation is targeted against Jews, but also against Christians when it comes to the New Testament. But again, this is not going to be something we will be discussing today, but it's not only something that Jews are being accused of. Also, Christians are accused of having forged the New Testament. 
So Muslims accuse Jews of having distorted, changed, having changed their uh, holy writing. And this is called the Tachrif. Why did Muslims come up with this idea that Jews have forged their Bible? Why would they want to accuse Jews of doing such a terrible thing? So now we're moving to the next uh, stage, the motivation. There were two main reasons why Muslims wanted to adopt that, that uh, argument. The first reason is the lack of references to Muhammad in the Hebrew Bible or in the New Testament for that matter. Muslims expected Muhammad to appear somewhere in the, in the Hebrew Bible. They expected to find some allusions, some references to Islam or more particularly to Muhammad in the Hebrew Bible. Why? The, so the basis for this idea is found already in the Quran itself. In one of the surahs, here I'll switch to that one. In one of the surahs, in the seventh surah, which is, if you remember, the sixth longest surah, because the first one is a little shorter. In the sixth, in the uh, seventh surah of the Quran, uh, Muhammad says, he preaches to the people of his time. And he says, he's uh, uh, praising the people that follow him, the people who believe in our science. And then I'm starting from verse 157, the ayah, 157 in the seventh surah. And he talks about those people who follow the messenger, the unlettered prophet, whom they find mentioned in the Torah and the gospel in their possession. He directs them to righteousness and turns them from evil and allows for them all good things and prohibits them for them wickedness and so on. So in the surah itself, it seems to be saying it seems to be a claiming that Muhammad already is supposed to appear in the Torah and in the, uh, in the New Testament, right? In the Gospels, in the Evangelioni. However, I think you're pretty much aware of the fact that Muhammad does not appear anywhere in our Bible. It doesn't say, Bereshit bara Elohim et Muhammad, right? It doesn't say Muhammad anywhere. There are some verses in which Muslims do argue that they're still uh, leftovers of Muhammad's uh, existence, even in the Hebrew Bible. That's a, a theme for another course about the Islamic interpretation of the existing version of the Hebrew Bible. But now we're talking about what's missing. So Muslims argue, if we don't find clear references to Muhammad anywhere in our Bible, it means that somebody must have been playing around with this text. So the first main reason for coming up with this accusation is the lack of references to Muhammad in the Bible, in the Hebrew Bible. And Muhammad, I mean also to Islam, but specifically to Muhammad, whose name they expected to find in the Hebrew Bible. But there was another reason that led to this accusation. Many, many stories appear, as I said, both in the Hebrew Bible and in the Quran, overlapping stories, similar stories. But some of these stories are not 100% identical. They might appear in one form in the Hebrew Bible and in a different form in the Quran. The most famous example I'm sure you're thinking about, and it's probably not a good example. It's not a good example. So what story are you thinking about? A different description of a similar event. What are you thinking about? Yeah, the Akedah. Yeah, the Akedah, right? The sacrifice yeah. that people assume that in the Quran, the son that was sacrificed was Ismail, Ishmael, whereas in the Hebrew Bible, it's Yitzchak. It's not a good example because in the Islamic world, there was actually a big debate who was the son that was sacrificed according to the Quran. In the 13th, 14th century, there was a tradition in Islam that the sacrificed son was actually Isaac and not Ismail. But let's use that as an example. But there are, other many, there are many other examples for this, but let's use this example. So if we find a story that appears in one form in the Hebrew Bible, but in a different form in the Quran. So what do we make of that? Here two Muslims had no other conclusion, but that the Jews must have been playing around with their text, that their text was forged, that some elements in the text changed in the course of time. So two main motivations we mentioned so far. The first motivation is lack of references to Muhammad in the Hebrew Bible. That's the first uh, motivation. And the second motivation is discrepancies, gaps, between the stories as they appear in the Hebrew Bible in contrast to the way that they appear in the Quran. But this is not good enough. 
because Muslims can't just say Jews have forged their Bible because Muhammad does not appear there, because that's not an argument that would ever convince your opponent. If you want to come up with an argument and prove or, prove or demonstrate that this is indeed the case, that Jews have forged the Bible, you can't bring a, a proof that is only based on your own belief, on the fact that you expect to find Muhammad in the Bible. That's not going to convince your opponents. So Muslims were trying to find not just uh, uh, come up with this argument, just not just to meet their own beliefs, but they also wanted to argue about this in an objective form. They wanted to find objective basis that would prove, that would convince their opponents, Jews or Christians, that their text is not authentic, that the text must have been changed in the course of uh, history. So what type of arguments that can they provide to demonstrate or to, to show that the Hebrew Bible or for that matter, the New Testament is not kept in its original formulation, that it must have been changed in the course of time. So Muslims used a few uh, arguments for, that they employ for this purpose. I would say that the, the governing idea is the Bible in its, current for, in, the, in its current form, the Hebrew Bible or the New Testament suffers from many, many difficulties. It's not a perfect text. These difficulties indicate that this text in its current form did not come from God. What type of problems did they come up with in every realm that you can think of? It could be theological problems. Uh, the most important issue involves the concept of Hagshama, presenting God as a human being with human uh, characteristics. In the Torah, God has a body. If you read it in a simplistic way, right? He has Etz by Elohim, he has a, a nose, haron af, he has human organs, and he also behaves like a human being. He's jealous, he's upset, he's happy. All these descriptions cannot be real according to the Islamic, in Islamic theology. Islam tends to view God in a very abstract manner, and the Hebrew description of, the, of, of God in the, in the Hebrew Bible sounded to Islam as a, almost I would say as a, a form of kfirah, of saying things that are, are violating the, any real uh, theology, as a pikosu. They couldn't accept the fact that in the Hebrew Bible, such uh, descriptions of God can appear. That is one example why Muslims will say the Jewish Bible in its current form is not original. That couldn't have come from God. So this is one realm, theology. But it's not just about theology, it's many, many other problems. Ethical problems. In Islam, the prophets are usually described in very clear cut ways, in black and white colors. There's no gray. People who are good are gonna be super good. And people that are wicked, they're gonna be described in the worst colors. It's not a book that has very, all these nuances that we're so familiar with in the Hebrew Bible. So when Muslims read the Bible, in the Hebrew version, in the Hebrew Bible, they will say there are all sorts of elements that prophets would never do. Our Parsha is a great example. The Parsha that we're about to read, Parsha Toldot, provides us with a few good examples for that. When Jacob wants to get the blessings from Esau, his brother, he's deceiving his father. A prophet can't do that. He will never deceive his, his parent. The forefathers are perfect. They're not going to do anything that, in, that is unethical. Uh, selling the Bechora, again, another example from our Parsha, and many, many other uh, descriptions of the Jewish, of the forefathers' behavior, ethical behavior, seems to negate what they believe could be the way that the, the prophets are living their lives. It's not just about ethical issues, it's also about their law, their, uh, the degree to which the forefathers are observing the Torah. Many of the forefathers seem to be violating very clear, uh, explicit rules in the Torah. Jacob, for instance, marries two sisters. But the Torah says, el lo tikach One is not supposed to marry two sisters. So how can Jacob marry two sisters? How can Abraham serve non-kosher food to the angels? So all these things are problems, ethical problems or legal type of problems that, the, are, that appear in the Hebrew Bible. In that sense, the Bible, the Hebrew Bible cannot be original. Somebody must have been playing with that text. 
changing some elements from the original formulation of that book. What else? Uh, all sorts of technical problems. Discrepancies between different passages from the, the story of creation in Genesis 1 comparison to Genesis 2. The order of events, chronological problems. Muslims were very, very tuned to every nuance in the text and they detect all sorts of problems and they say, this is not something that is only rooted in our own Islamic beliefs. This is, these are objective arguments. The Bible in its current form cannot be original. As a matter of fact, some scholars even argue that Muslims trying in, in this attempt to uh, prove that Jews have forged the text actually uh, were able to, to sense many, many difficulties that will eventually lead to what modern uh, higher biblical criticism uh, will argue about different documents in the text. So in that sense, they were very, very uh, sensitive to these problems, but this is coming from their own theological perspective. They're very eager to show that the Hebrew Bible is a forged text. This is a base, this is an objective argument. It's not just because Muhammad is not there. That's not going to convince a Jew. Obviously, Muhammad is not there from a Jewish perspective because he was never there. But if we find objective flaws, difficulties in the book, that could already show that Jews have, have uh, been distorting this text, have been playing around with this text. But there was another argument that they were using, and that is something that is based on what we've learned in the previous sessions. In the previous sessions, we learned that there are many, many places where we have differences between different textual versions of the Hebrew Bible. Essentially, there are differences between the Septuagint and the Masoretic text. Islamic authors were familiar with this difference and they probably learned from Jews or from Christians that there are gaps between their own versions of the Hebrew Bible. That too was the way that Muslims were showing the Bible must have been distorted. Somebody is playing around with this text. This text was not kept in its original form throughout the ages. So what have we said so far? We addressed the question of definition, what is the khif? We explained the Islamic motivation. Why did they want to say that? And we also addressed some of the basis, some of the proofs that they were trying to prove, objective proof uh, that would support this argument. And the next question that I I called here the target, I don't know if that's the best word to use for this is, so who is the person who forged the Bible and why did he do that? I think that if I would tell you that the, if the main argument was that Muhammad's names has been removed from the Bible, so, and I would ask you, so who would do that? When would somebody have a need or when would somebody be motivated to remove the name of Muhammad? What time in history would that take place? When would that happen? What period? When would somebody want to remove Muhammad's name from the Bible? After he, after he was uh, dead. Or, right. Or dead. So we would expect, right, exactly. We would expect that the person who was being accused of having changed the Hebrew Bible must have appeared after the rise of Islam. It's only when Muhammad appears and he's become, becoming this big successful prophet, maybe some Jews will be threatened by this new figure who's uh, taking over Judaism and Christianity and having all these people join his new sect religion. And then they would be under pressure. They would try to remove any reference or any proof to that new religion so that Jews don't follow this new prophet. So in theory, you would expect them to accuse somebody that is in the post-Islamic age. However, this was not the case. Muslims usually find a different target, a different person that they accuse of having done this forgery. And here I need to say something very general. Muslims are not very concrete and uh, consistent about these arguments. So this is an ongoing process and different people might speak in slightly different manners. But there's a governing theory that becomes very, very common among many in many, many Islamic writings. They accuse one particular figure that you all know for having forged the Bible. And that person is Ezra Asofer, Ezra the scribe of the end, from the end of our Hebrew Bible. Ezra Asofer becomes one of the most important figures that Muslims would accuse for having forged the Bible. And the next question I wanna ask you is why did they choose him? Why would he be the fitting person uh, to come up with this forgery? Why would Ezra be the one that they choose 
to uh, to come up with uh, with this uh, harsh idea of having distorted the Hebrew Bible. Why did they choose him? Well, even yeah, I, even I mean, there are sources in rabbinic literature that some people taught, tried to suppress, but they were there that when they came back from Babel, every the Torah was mixed up. So Ezra put them together. There are some rabbis, medieval rabbis, who say that they they don't. It doesn't sound like they make it systemic, the whole Torah, but 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 that he had to correct text. And uh, uh, I mean, there are rabbis who deny that these midrashim even exist, but they do, they do exist. I mean, OK, so you're touching on a very, very, very important point. I want to say one thing before I get to those traditions, and then I'll continue with what you were saying. I think it makes a lot of sense to choose Ezra, and maybe that is the reason why they chose Ezra. And that is because Ezra appears in a very specific timing or in very particular timing in Jewish history. The Jews go on exile to Babylon and it seems that they forget a lot of their tradition. When they come back to the land of Israel after the declaration of Cyrus, they start rebuilding the temple, Ezra and Nehemiah come back uh, to Israel. And when you hear, you read their prophecies or their, their descriptions, it seems that nobody knows anything anymore. They start teaching people how to observe the Chag of Sukkot, and nobody heard about that. They start telling people how, that they need to, uh, adopt, to to follow all sorts of commandments that they were probably not familiar with. This is a very strong indication. This provides a very strong indication that Jews probably forgot the text during the time of exile. If somebody wants to find an opportunity to change a book, to come up with a new formulation, it's got to be in a timing when people are not familiar with the original text. If I were to tell you right now to take your Bibles and change them and introduce my name and everywhere, you wouldn't follow what I'm saying because you have your Bibles, you know what it's supposed to say. You're not going to change your own books. But if the book is already forgotten, it provides a very good opportunity for somebody to adjust certain ideas, to change certain uh, principles in the book. So this is probably one reason. It's also rooted in some more general Islamic idea that traditions are only reliable when you have, when you're able to, to trace the transmission process of each tradition. There's isnad, like a testimony of the tra trained of tradition, how this tradition is, is moving or is shifting from person to person. But if a tradition is lacking that proof or lacking that tradition, the tradition is already becoming less reliable. So Ezra, is a very strong, provides us with a very strong indication that something must have been forgotten before his lifetime. And that's also the golden opportunity, provides him with a golden opportunity to change certain things in the Hebrew Bible. In addition to that, I would add what the, Joel was saying, that there are all sorts of rabbinic traditions that also seem to grant Ezra with a very big importance or role in the transmission of the Bible. They even say in one place, that mitna Torah le Moshe, if the Torah was not given to Moshe, Ezra could have received the same text himself. In other places, they say that Ezra was the one who managed to have people remember certain traditions that were forgotten. Muslims were very tuned to all of these traditions. They were familiar with a lot of Jewish and rabbinic traditions, and they probably heard that Jews tell stories about Ezra as somebody who was able to re reestablish their tradition. And the gap or the leap from this to arguing that he forged the text was not something that was so dramatic. What is more problematic from the Islamic perspective is to explain why would he do that? And why would he want to remove the references, references to Islam in his book centuries before the rise of Islam? Why are his changes, how can his changes explain the gaps between the Bible the Hebrew Bible and the Quran. How did that influence all the theological and ethical problems? This is something that Muslims usually did not bother explaining. They just chose Ezra as the target of, the, of this type of accusation. And from then on, he becomes the person most affiliated or most, most associated with the idea of this tahrif business of forging the Hebrew Bible. We're almost done. We have two more items we need to address. Inspiration. Who inspired Muslims to come up with this argument? Why did they suddenly decide to accuse Jews of forgery? The obvious solution would be that they were inspired 
by Christians. In earlier centuries, Christians were accusing Jews of forging their Bible. And what could be more natural than taking over this accusation, just as in other realms, Muslims take over existing traditions. So if they hear that Christians are accusing Jews of having forged the new te their, their Hebrew Bible, removing references to Jesus, it would have been a natural move or natural uh, thing for them to come up with a similar accusation regarding Muhammad. So that's why many scholars will argue that the inspiration came from the Jewish Christian uh, polemic or debate. However, there are some scholars who claim that it was actually coming from within. Shi'is, Shiites and Sunnis were also accusing each other of having forged certain elements in the Quran. Shiites assumed that Ali uh, was supposed to be found more explicitly in the Quran, and he's not. And they were also accusing the Sunnis for having forged the Quran, when possibly before the Quran was put into writing. So for that, per for that reason, some scholars argue that the inspiration is actually not something that is coming from the Jewish Christian debate, but rather from within uh, the, the Islamic world itself. Either way, the accusation becomes a very common uh, argument that would appear throughout the medieval period. And this leads us to the last uh, question that we need to address. Where do we find this accusation in Islamic literature? So I want to recommend, if you're interested in reading more about this, uh, two things. One thing, one book I mentioned here before uh, that I, I included in the, in the presentation, a book by Chava Lazarus Yafe. Here you see the name of the book. In Hebrew, it's called Olamot Zurim, but the book was actually written originally in English. The Hebrew is the translation. She was a professor at Hebrew University, and she wrote this beautiful book that talks about that provides you with all this information about the Islamic treatment of the Hebrew Bible. She also argues that Islamic medieval, uh, Islamic literature in the medieval period is also what provided the roots for later biblical criticism. That part of her argument, some scholars would probably not accept, but her basic treatment of the Islamic world and, its, and the way that it addresses the Hebrew Bible that's something that still holds. It's a beautiful book, very easy to read. It's a collection of articles that she read and I recommend. Uh, if you wanna read more about this, you can find all this information. My lecture now is also heavily based on the stuff that she writes in her book. And here you see her description of the concept of tahrif or tabdil. Uh, by the way, I, I live in Yerushalayim and I very often, uh, encounter Muslims in different places, you know, in all sorts of places, I always try to ask them, what do they know about tahrif or tabdiyah to see if this is an existing idea that they still are familiar with, or this is something that only scholars speak about. And many Muslims even nowadays are familiar with this type of accusations that Jews have forged their Bible. What exactly the story of this accusation, they're not necessarily familiar with, but the basic concept that Jews have a forged text, that's something that you would hear and also that Christians have forged the New Testament. So where do we find this accusation for the first time? Uh, Camila Adan, she's a scholar that was uh, in Tel Aviv University. She wrote a book called uh, Muslims Authors on, uh, I think it's on Jews and Judaism, something of that sort. And she has a collection, this is a very uh, impressive collection of Muslims writing on Jews and on the Hebrew Bible. And there you will find numerous quotes where Muslims in the ninth and 10th century say very explicitly that Jews have forged their text. That entire book is in English. So if you're looking for quotes about what did Muslims say about the Jews, that's a very useful source. The big question is if it's found before the ninth century, before the eighth century, and even more daring idea, did Muhammad himself express such a view? And this is something that is not so clear cut. Some people claim that this accusation is already found in the Quran itself. And this is the last uh, text I wanted to show you. Here you see two passages from the second surah of the Quran. And here you will see that uh, as in many other places, the translation makes a significant difference because the way you precisely translate the words might have some, it might have uh, drastic implications on who was Muhammad referring to. In this translation, it says in fairly vague words, 
Do you then hope that they would believe in you and the party from among them indeed used to hear the word of Allah, then altered it after they had understood it? And they know this. Very vague language. A party from among them. Who is he speaking about? What text did they hear from God? And uh, later on, uh, they have, a, what does he say? They altered it. What is he referring to? In another place also, a few verses later on, in the second surah, he says, woo then to those who write the book with their, with their hands and say this is from Allah so that they may take for it a small price. So woo to them for what their hands write and woo for, to them for what they earn. Also something very vague, very unclear. But in other translations of the Quran, people often would translate in a way that would sound much more concrete and relevant to the story of the Hebrew Bible. In a sense, an accusation that Jews have forged their Torah. I want to conclude this uh, session. I'll stop the sharing of this screen. And I want to see if I can show you a record of these two verses in the Quran in Arabic with some English translation. Let's see if that works. And if that works, you'll hear it a different way that people sometimes present this. So tell me if you hear this well. Okay. Do you see the screen? Okay, now let's see if that works. Oh, this is, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. This is the same screen I showed you before. One second. That's not what I was looking for. Okay, do you see this screen now? Okay, so this is a, rec a recording of the Quran, both in Arabic and in uh, English. This is one verse beforehand. I didn't want to start immediately so you can hear the whole thing. Let's see if you can hear the voice here. And water comes out. Do you hear? And there are some of them that fall down for fear of Allah. And Allah is not unaware of what you do. Now we're reaching the verse. <laughs> Do you covet the hope, O believers, that they would believe for you while a party of them used to hear the words of Allah and then distort the Torah after they had understood it while they were knowing? Okay. I'll just stop there. Okay. okay, did you hear, did you manage to hear the recording? So I think you saw that there, they said very specifically, the word was the Torah, people who altered the words of the Torah. When you hear the word Torah, it sends a very clear, concrete message that this is talking about Jews having distorted their text. But again, this is not something that will be accepted on all uh, translators of the text or, or academics who deal with this accusation. So to conclude what we saw today, we learned that in addition to what Christians were saying to Jews, to the Christian accusation that Jews have forged the Bible, now we learn that there was also an Islamic accusation and now Jews are being attacked from both ends. So how do Jews respond to this? We'll have to wait for a week to hear a little bit about the Jewish responses to this question and we can proceed then on towards the modern period. Okay, so that's the end of today's class. All right, thank you. And I'm glad to, I'm glad that the uh, audio ultimately worked out. Um, I'm happy to, I know we're at the top of the hour, but if people have questions, I'm happy to keep the um, stream open for a few more minutes. It's, um, and just a point of housekeeping as it is coming up on uh, the, uh, the federal holiday Thanksgiving for our, in the US, we will have some, um, changes to our schedule. I'm just going to make sure I have them at hand, but the best way I can put it is our, so that affect our, when is our next session? Um, if you want to catch up with this class and yeah. other sessions of the quest for the text, you can catch them online at our Facebook page. You can 
you can we cert cert certainly worth it, especially with all the material that we've covered in the past several weeks. And you can also see other classes from our Falls Bond on on our on our Facebook on our Facebook page. The classes generally go up within a, a half hour within a half hour of class. Okay, I'm adding my email if somebody needs to ask any questions on the chat. And I think that's it for today. All right. Okay. And our, and our next class, our next class is Feeding Babies from the Torah Today with Ravanit Leah Sarna. This is a new series. The first session is at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you want to find out about this and other in other Drisha classes, you can sign up at drisha.org slash classes. Um, and to answer Ruth's question, not yet. We're currently working on it. Our audio library is under construction, but we hope so. But you can, you are able to access recordings without a without a face and go onto our business Facebook page without a Facebook account.